Stories connect us and who tells them matters. This is especially true when it comes to the story of our heating planet. Hi everyone from Alliance Magazine in London and welcome to our panel event today where we're bringing together expert journalists and researchers as well as the funders who support that work to have a conversation about who's telling the climate story and who's paying for it. Um, I'm Elika Ruhi, the digital editor at Alliance, and I will be the moderator of today's event, which is a part of Alliance's Climate Philanthropy 2030 project. Climate Philanthropy 2030 is a project we launched in 2020 as a decade-long initiative to improve our coverage of climate philanthropy because Alliance sees it as the defining issue of the decade and because we also want to push the philanthropy sector to commit more than 2% of its funding to this issue. Before we get started today, just a few notes for everyone who's tuning in. Um, go ahead and say hello in our chat, which you should be able to view on the right hand side of your screen. Later, we'll be taking questions from the audience, so make sure to get your questions in here or you can upvote others. So there's a, a tab for chat as well as a tab for Q&A. And if you put your questions in the Q&A tab, um, it will better help us sort of keep track of the questions and you can also comment on other people's questions. Um, you can also join the discussion on Twitter with at Alliance Mag and using the hashtag Climate Philanthropy 2030. And if you missed all of that, it's that information is at the bottom of the slides, which you'll be able to see throughout our conversation. Um, everyone attending this event today is entitled to a 20% discount on any Alliance subscription using the code CLIMATE23. An Alliance subscription gives you access to exclusive subscri subscriber content, four issues of the magazine a year, and free access to all future events. You can find a link to our subscription page in the chat now, and we'll also be sharing this by email afterwards, as well as a recording of today's event. Now I'm delighted to introduce our expert panel. We're joined today by Sven Egenter, the Editor-in-Chief of Clean Energy Wire, Michaela Weiss, the Director of Global Forest Watch at the World Resources Institute, and Arti Kosla, the Founder and Director of Climate Trends. So we're very excited to have all of you with us today. Um, and now on to the main event. So Sven, I would like to start by opening the floor up to you. Clean Energy Wire is an exciting platform because it's both media, but also part of your mission is to foster cross-border cooperation among reporters that are covering climate change. Can you talk a little bit about your work at Clean Energy Wire? Yeah, well, thank you, Elika, and to Alliance Magazine, and good afternoon to everybody from uh, actually surprisingly sunny Berlin today. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's really an excellent time to give you a little bit of a insights in, in, in our experience as journalists, working for journalists for the last 10 years at Clean Energy Wire and, and Klimafakten.de. We are now a team of in total 14 people uh, doing this. And uh, it's really a good time because I, I've just attended an event uh, with the top brass of German policymakers and, and decision makers on um, the, the energy transition. And one of the key lines I took away from that was a number of them actually saying that 50% of the road ahead, the energy transition and uh, the, the move to climate neutrality now hinges in communication because, you know, there's so many stakeholders involved. So journalism clearly falls into that category. Uh, and that's also, also something that, which we find really exciting because obviously we, we live, live and breathe that, but it's also an indication of the challenge we have ahead. Um, now, what do we actually do and how do we tackle this challenge of getting the story right on climate change and climate action? Well, I'd say you mentioned that we have a quite unique model. Um, we do our own reporting. We cover the big stories with loads of background and analysis and fact sheets on the processes that are the energy transition. Um, so people who cover this story less frequently, journalists, but also experts, uh, can you know get the whole sort of process and the whole storyline, so they don't have to jump into uh, a big story totally unprepared. So that that's one key element that we do our own reporting based on some really strong principles, which I've taken from my time at Reuters. Um, we really work as an independent newsroom. We're evidence based, uh, but also, and that makes us unique, I guess, in the combination. We focus on collaborative efforts and with cross-border stories and um, you know, a solution orientation. We see the energy transition as one of the big solution stories to climate, uh, the climate crisis. And, and what we've added straight from the beginning in 2014 was a sort of 
different approach to journalism in the sense that we made our resources, our work, ourselves available to fellow journalists. So we collaborate, but we're literally, you know, available if they need us as, as a support act or as someone, you know, to, to get contacts and, and expertise on the tough subjects, um, everything from the coal exit to, um, to, you know, the electricity market, which is really complex, but important to get the story right if you want to move to a climate neutral society. Um, most importantly, and I think that's what most of our colleagues would say that the, the, the sort of like the star, the, the, the crown jewel, if you want, is uh, our study tours where we really take colleagues from across the world right to the heart of the matter, where they get direct access to stakeholders and, and, and the people who make and shake um, policy around uh, climate action. Um, so we've done, for instance, a tour on the role of nuclear power in a climate neutral Europe in France. Actually, it was a three country tour. We took them to Germany, France and Switzerland to look at different approaches and models to understand, you know, where the, the differences lie in a cross border negotiation, for instance. Or we took colleagues from Southeast Asia to the coal mining regions of Germany to see, you know, how the transition is looking there. Um, and we had colleagues, you know, going to Brussels to assess what energy security um, stories uh, out of Brussels, how they are discussed and produced actually there, the decision making process. Um, and that has created a sort of community of practice among journalists, um, which has translated into what we now call our networking efforts. So we also boost collaboration among others, where we are only involved as a sort of matchmaker, if you want, through our network of now 360 journalists who've signed up for that um, from across the globe, 80 countries. Um, so we, you know, invite them, you know, to discuss subjects. We offer contacts again, and we also do, you know, stimulate sometimes with cross-border grants to, you know, get them really going on these subjects. And, and the final thing, which is really interesting over the last few years that has just emerged is that, you know, We've got so much expertise through the direct contact with the stories and through ClimaFact and our second platform, we're looking into climate communication and what makes it work um, so that we are now, uh, you know, <laughs> we've been approached, we didn't actually actively do this from some of the biggest media houses in Germany and, and across beyond actually. Um, to, to, you know, do workshops and, and seminars and trainings on how to cover this story appropriately, because people and the media have realized that they haven't done a good job so far. So this is in a nutshell, uh, what we've been doing so far, what have we achieved? I mean, we're talking to a group of people who care about the impact. I would say, I think three things we've, you know, created a baseline, you know, on energy and, and, and climate reporting on the subjects we cover. You know, you can't say that you didn't know, that you didn't know where to turn to if you want to do your own reporting. So we created this baseline that helps journalists to get faster into the story. And, and the second thing is we created this community uh, uh, through the capacity building of now over 1,500 uh, journalists from across the globe uh, who, you know, have a basic understanding or a better understanding and know who to turn to among each other if they want to collaborate on stories that might be harder or underreported so far. And the final thing, as I mentioned, is we are now in talks with other media about how to do it properly. Um, that was, you know, a, a very welcome side effect, I have to say, uh, of our work in the past few years. Um, yeah, so th that's in a nutshell what we do. I mean, I'm sure there will be questions about what matters now and how you can, you know, what, what are other elements that, that are worth looking into, but um, I'm sure these questions will come up. I mean, uh, there is plenty, as we all know, in the climate crisis to, to report on, and there's also plenty to do wrongly and to get wrong. So I'm sure some questions will come up in the course of, of our conversations. Thanks, Sven. There's a lot there that's really interesting. And I think this thing that you mentioned right at the start about how climate hinges on communication, it's really sort of acknowledging that I think we as as people who are consuming these stories of climate and sort of maybe getting to a new stage of recognizing where the climate crisis is at are are really um, 
we're needing better information, better journalism, better research. And I think that there is a huge space here for climate journalism and for philanthropy that wants to support that. So before I move off of off of you, I wanted to ask, what is the funding model for Clean Energy Wire? Can you share a little bit about that? Oh, sure. I mean, we've been, uh, you know, immensely fortunate so far that we have two core funders, the Mercato Foundation uh, out of Germany and the European Climate Foundation. Uh, Mercato is the 80% the, the funder of our 1.3 million per year budget. Um, and what, what has made it really unique, and I have to say that I cannot stress that enough, and I didn't know how important that would be until I started doing this, is the sort of long-term commitment those two have put into our project actually right from the start with a starting grant of three and a half years rather than you know an individual one for shorter terms that has given us space to build our brand to build our reputation and to test things and also dismiss things if they didn't work um, without sort of like falling back to to the position zero and and that has been really important. And I said, I, we have a unique model of doing journalism and combining it with good climate communication. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure, but 100% sure, but I would say 99% sure that is unique because, you know, you can only do that with um, that sort of philanthropic uh, funding. Definitely. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm going to move on now, but there's lots to come back to a bit later. Um, so, Michaela, next I wanted to come on to you. So, you work with World Resources Institute, which has this amazing initiative called Data Platforms, which provides open data for journalists and researchers and anyone else access to open and reliable data for actionable change, as I think how you guys put it. Um, so, you lead one of these tracks, the Global Forest Watch platform. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So as you said, I work at the World Resources Institute, and for those that aren't aware, we are a global research organization that's working at the intersection of climate, nature, and people. And data is really at the heart of what we do as WRI. So in fact, the, the motto of WRI is count it, change it, and scale it. So really recognizing that we need to understand the extent of the problem, so that's the count it part, before we can even get started. And really data and research is at the heart of that. The next part is then to change it. So making use of that information to move the needle in the way that we want to see in the world and finally scale it. So not just have that impact at individual locations, but actually be able to replicate that around the world. And as you said, we have a number of data platforms that I think really showcase that motto in action. Um, so we have various platforms that are showcasing maps and statistics on a variety of different topics. Um, so using that data that's created either by WRI or pulled from public areas or that we do in collaboration with other researchers, uh, again, that's the kind of count it part of it. So having that data available, change it is, is the work that we do with partners. And, and I'll talk a little bit about some of our work with journalists through the Global Forest Watch platform specifically. Uh, and then finally, scale it. I think that's a really key part of these platforms is that everything is publicly available online for free so anyone in the world can access this information at any time and so it's really democratizing and opening up information that previously you know might have been available in a pdf report or a rather paper report uh, from a, a government agency or international uh, organization so as i said we have more than a dozen data platforms at wri right now uh, they cover a wide span of topics uh, we have climate watch which is looking at emissions at a national level and comparing that to NDCs. Uh, our landmark platform is mapping indigenous and community territories and, and looking at land rights at a global scale. And the, the platform that I lead is Global Forest Watch, which is using satellite imagery to track how forests are changing across the world. So just uh, to bring to this audience and the topic at hand of climate, uh, of course, forests are hugely important for the global climate. They're very unique in that they are both a source and a sink for carbon. So healthy and, and growing forests are actually sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. But when they're cut down or burned, then they are emitting that carbon. Um, and so it's a really critical piece of the climate story. It's, it's a very uh, immediate and cost-effective way 
to mitigate climate change by stopping deforestation. So that's really the focus of our platform is, again, we need to know where deforestation is happening, uh, how the trend is looking over time in order to put in place effective strategies to stop it. So we work with many different stakeholders, but journalists are an important group that we are actively targeting through our platform. Um, <clears throat> so we make this data, this information about where forests are changing available through uh, the Global Forest Watch map, which I like to call it the Google Maps of forests, um, as well as through our dashboards, which have statistics at a national and, and subnational level. And one of the key ways that we're supporting journalism is just by having that information available. So there are many journalists that are working on stories related to forests who have a, a specific question or particular data point that they would like to use for their story. And they can come directly to our website, globalforestwatch.org, and pull out that number um, without any input from us. There are also a lot of different uh, functionalities on, on those dashboards in particular where you can filter you know, if you're writing a story about deforestation in Brazil, you can look at the statistics for Brazil over time. You could look at statistics within indigenous territories in particular, within a particular state, within protected areas, um, and really drill down into the level of detail that you want to see. So that's one way. The second way is uh, a bit more, as, as Sven was talking about, is really working hand in hand with reporters. So we are constantly getting requests from reporters who want a bit more guidance on how to talk about forests uh, and in particular how they can use the data available on Global Forest Watch um, to say something useful and, and meaningful uh, about what is happening in, in particular places. We also do a lot of explainer type materials. Uh, we have a digital report called the Global Forest Review where we're taking those global statistics, the same ones that are on our platform, but you know, putting kind of the, our expert commentary analysis and context to really describe you know, what should you be taking away from these trends and, and what does this really mean and what are some of the caveats associated with this kind of global data. And then the third way that we're working with journalists is actually supporting investigative journalism, uh, particularly in tropical countries. So we have financially supported a, a, a few journalists uh, in tropical countries individually. We've also worked with um, different networks uh, such as Manga Bay's investigative uh, journalism network, the Rainforest in Investigations Network from the Pulitzer Center and others um, to really drill down more at the local level. So not so much in the statistics, but using some of our map based data and deforestation alerts that indicate where illegal deforestation may be happening. Um, and then use that information to actually do further investigation and do reporting about some of those areas and hopefully call attention to the problem um, in very specific contexts. So uh, happy to get more into this in the Q and a, um, but again, you know, I really do think that journalists are a key audience of some of this work and really critical in moving the needle uh, on forests and, and on other issues in general um, by having this data to back up their stories. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Michaela. Um, yeah, there's loads of stuff on the um, data platforms that you guys have. And I, before we move away, I just wanted to ask, because you have all of these different tracks, how, how did WRI sort of come up with these tracks? Is this something, because you say you work hand in hand with journalists, and I'm wondering, was it something that came from you guys, or did it come sort of in collaboration with the work that you're doing with some of your partners and the journalists? Or if you could explain a bit about that, that would be great. Yeah. So these data platforms have been around for quite some time. Uh, Global Forest Watch is one of the oldest ones at WRI. And in fact, we actually started around the year 2000. Um, a similar ambition, but the tech just wasn't there to be able to do something global scale. So we were you know, producing maps uh, that we would like print out and, and put in uh, government offices in, in various countries where we worked. Um, but over time, you know, as the technology has improved, we've been able to get that information online and do this larger scale. Um, and I would say, you know, journalists have been involved from the beginning. Um, we started off with a, a data set looking at the annual change in tree cover from 2000 to 2012. Um, and that sparked a ton of media attention and just a, a, an understanding and a, 
just about the importance of forests and how quickly we are losing them. And so that's something that from the very beginning we recognize as a key audience for this information. And now every year when we update those numbers, you know, we're proactively reaching out and, and, and speaking with journalists in order to cover the latest about what's going on in the world's forests. Thanks. Thanks, Michaela. Um, great. Yeah, loads there. I think we'll come back to some of it during the Q&A. But um, next, we want to come to Arti. Uh, so, Arti, you work with Climate Trends, your founder and director. Uh, Climate Trends is an organization that aims to bring greater focus to climate change through communications and capacity building, influencing the public policy and behavior change. Can you tell us a little bit about what the organization does and your work there? Thanks very much for having me here. Uh, Climate Trends started about six years ago, and the reason why we created a startup to communicate about climate change in India was largely because we felt that it was a way that climate was interacting with every other development challenge that India was facing. So while on the one hand, you can always say that there are development challenges on health, on gender, on education, and climate does not take precedence, but at the same time, they were so intersecting with how climate policy could influence every other policy that we felt that a better way to engage uh, with some of the influencers uh, in our defined target audience would be to actually set some principles of how we communicate about climate uh, in the first place. And I think it's quite important to understand in that context uh, how India, now the most populous country, a very large economy, but also quite a big contributor to global emissions, and yet, uh, you know, uh, quite cognizant of the fact that individual emissions are quite low and there is still a long way to go. Uh, where prosperity can can meet a large part of the population, it's it becomes very complex to communicate about climate change. And I think these were really the kind of challenges that we were grappling uh, with about five years back when we we actually set some principles of how we could establish the role of strategic communications beyond just surface announcements and key phrases. So the kind of stuff that we do now is, for instance, uh, creating a climate lexicon and the way uh, the way the way communication and media is consumed in india to give you an example the top 10 newspapers of the country are not in english which means when you talk to people there is a certain way to communicate about climate change we've made a very small attempt but uh, at the moment uh, you know for example recently in two regional languages which are spoken by more than more than 5 uh, 5 million uh, actually more than more than 50 million people we've uh, we've we've created what climate change terminologies mean in the regional languages and the idea is uh, that we hope that through creating local language phrases and words which make sense to journalists who are reporting on the issue locally or who are re reporting about extreme weather events that are happening in that city or that town or that district or that state it just allows greater greater discussion of a topic which is otherwise just relegated to an english newspaper and talking about whenever an extreme weather event happens and you know we felt in in our view that it it was vital to define how we are engaging accurately uh, I, I can also speak briefly about data and, um, you know, Michaela spoke about it and uh, pretty much my, my sense also is that, especially when it comes to engaging with policymakers, that's the space that climate trend occupies. We don't largely reach out to the to the general public, quote unquote, but do, we do make efforts to engage with the journalist community to, to create a bigger tent when it comes to involving editors, journalists, reporters, but also creating some kind of a way in which we can reach out to policymakers. And I felt that, you know, creating data platforms on how uh, air quality monitors across the country are showing numbers of air pollution or how over a 10 year or a five year trajectory health indicators across key cities of India are getting impacted with air pollution or even things like uh, as as uh, a lot of the the provincial or the state uh, state governments come up with policies on electric vehicles how fast the pickup is and how the change is happening how buses or cars or two wheelers are changing in, uh, to electric and essentially trying to kind of portray it through some kind of 
data journalism or data visualization platform, which is either pulling data from from central government or federal sources or open information or through rights to information has just been a way to to offer more information in a format which is not synthesized uh, as before. And I think uh, I think that has been of value. I will say just two more points and then maybe we can come to it in the questions. And that's really about the space that we feel that we have occupied through our co communications venture to create uh, our journalism product, which is called Carbon Copy. Uh, which essentially, uh, you know, I've I've borrowed and 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 sought advice and intel from colleagues like Sven, who are present here on what's the what's the potential even to build the voices in India to build climate reportage in India and carbon copy has literally been a venture from scratch, uh, which now reaches out to about uh, seven thousand people, uh, two thousand of whom are just journalists in India, and the idea is to create that one stop shop which simplifies the complexities uh, and India's position in climate geopolitics, but also shows solutions from the point of view of not just pilot projects, but how climate as a solution sits where development challenges in India and climate challenges are not versus each other, but are really complementary to each other. And I think that's the role that Carbon Copy tries to, tries to fill which is not to put development and climate against each other, but to try and con contextualize climate in an Indian context of, of what makes sense, because in the end, we believe that a narrative is only as successful as it's relevant. So we've tried to make it uh, as much relevant in the, in, in the Indian context uh, as possible. Uh, I think there is lots more to be said on, on a country like India, where uh, extreme weather events are really increasing and i will only pause by saying that my personal feeling has been that just the way extreme weather events are getting reported uh, right now in the country through twitter uh, through the the met department and others really uh, kind of taking the mantle of uh, sending daily updates and weather reports which wasn't the case before it really feels to me that there is a lot more traction that we can get uh, simply because the things like heat stress and cyclones are, are are quite a major part of lived experience of the public. And if we have to look at the next stage of building further further comms, I think the challenges are much, much bigger, but our entry points will be will be much more than uh, than I, I'd say how we how we really had to navigate a lot of the issues about 10 years ago. Now the lived reality of climate itself, uh, as as much as it's challenging, also presents uh, that that need uh, to really intervene at places which are not just the COPs or the G7s or the G20s. I think climate is a much alive discussion across uh, the pyramid in India, and and, and that itself uh, needs recognition. Thanks, Arti. That's all really interesting, and I think especially this idea of. Um, like the climate conversation is not just a few times a year at these big summits, but now it's every day where we're where we're getting the weather reports because the extreme weather events are just more and more common. I think that's something that we'll see a lot more in climate comms platforms. Um, but just before we move on, I wanted to ask, how does climate trends work with philanthropy? Can you share a little bit about your guys's funding model? Yes. Uh... Climate trends started about five years back, and from from uh, then till now, we have mostly and largely been funded uh, by philanthropy. And I divide philanthropy uh, in that sense, and you know, for for our context, as uh, at least as Western philanthropy, who are funding a large part of the climate movement, but it's also uh, encouraging at this moment to see domestic philanthropy at least making a start in the Indian context to look at the subject of climate, but also to look at the subject of communicating uh, climate in the way that we are doing. Uh, I will only say that there is a long way to go, uh, but I do believe that uh, encouraging domestic uh, funding and domestic philanthropy, which does exist in India and for decades, there has been a tradition. And you know, if you will look at numbers, then there is a large uh, corporate social responsibility component that goes into public health uh, projects, into education and gender. 
And I just feel that if the next couple of years are also invested in showing interactions with climate, then there is a lot more room for domestic uh, philanthropy uh, that can also be built. But at the moment, uh, climate trends as well as carbon copy are largely funded uh, so far by Western philanthropy and a little bit by uh, by some of the new uh, uh, and 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 the initial and nascent stages of uh, Indian climate philanthropy organizations as well. Thanks, Arti. I will say, as the manager of a climate reporting platform at a nonprofit media organization myself, definitely um, there's a long way to go, but there's also been a huge amount of movement, I think, in the last several years. So it's really encouraging and also nice to see, I think, across the board that movement is happening um, in, in different countries. Um, great. Well, thank you to you and also our other two panelists for your opening remarks. We're going to um, now get into our Q and A, but just before that, we actually have a question for our audience, um, which you should be able to see this on the right hand side of your screen. Um, in the top that says Slido, there should be a poll that pops up and it, there's a question that says, what aspect of climate change do you wish was getting more coverage from climate journalism? So have a think about that, enter a word. Um, it's going to come up with a word cloud and we will take a look at this um, in another few minutes. I'll give everyone a chance to sort of fill this in. Um, but just before but before we get into the poll, maybe we can start taking a look at some of the questions that have come in. So also a reminder to everyone that you can submit a question. Um, there's a few places to do it. Uh, so there's a Q&A tab and there's also, it looks like a Q&A tab in the Slido poll. So if you send us a question, we'll try to get to it. Um, but yeah, maybe our first question. Um, this is one that came in advance. So disinformation, I think, is also a really big and tough problem that everybody is trying to tackle in the media space. And climate disinformation, I think, is holding us back also like very, with very practical elements of we need to move forward. And when there is not correct information out there, it's keeping us back. So. Um, the question is, how can philanthropy combat climate disinformation? And is this something that you're sort of thinking about in the work that you guys are doing either with philanthropists or within foundations? Um, so maybe Sven, can I ask you to start with that one? Oh, I think you're on mute, sorry. The classic after all these yes. times. Anyway, that's a very good question. And there are two layers to, to climate disinformation that, that's making our life hard at this point in time and prevents us from moving forward altogether. One is the real hardcore climate climate, you know, denialism as you call, you know, spreading the sort of message that it's not a big deal, it's not a problem, and it's not proven and all that. I think this bit is shrinking. I don't know about other countries, but here we are seeing less of that in Europe and, and in the context where we work. But what's becoming more important is what we call the discourses of delay. When this is the sort of like, yeah, we might do this, but not that way. Oh, actually, you know, this has so many side effects that, that the measures you're suggesting, you know, we all know that about wind turbines, we know, know it about, you know, other renewable energies, but also when, when you talk about the social impact, I've seen a question running through about just climate transition, that's always used um, sort of more or less um, on purpose to slow things down. Now, how can you work on that? Well, there are basically, well, a number of ways in how philanthropy can support that. We and, and our German platform, Klimafakt, and we created what we call a base course, a sort of introduction course to climate disinformation and how to detect it and created a poster on that. What are the techniques? So people start understanding not just the facts, but the way these are used to create disinformation and these discourses of delay. Um, and that actually was such a success that it was used during the COVID uh, pandemic uh, by, you know, Germans leading epidemiologist to explain to the public how disinformation in that case on the pandemic worked. So we try to really enable people in general to understand you know, how disinformation works so they can spot it, how to fact check themselves. And then obviously the second layer, this is the work with journalists. And this is really trying to tell everyone you know, we, we can work with 
that they have a role to play in explaining what's going on and also in making themselves sure that they're not falling for the misinformation um, and even be it involuntarily. I mean, you know, some some of the stuff sounds really reasonable and, and, and at the core, a lot of the discourses of delay are a, a, an important one, like the one about fairness and just transition. But from a certain point on, it's just used to slow down uh, climate action and, and, and it's enabled journalists and to work with them on that, that that's, you know, a second an important element and that needs support. You know, if you, you ask me, what can philanthropy do? Well, in both cases, you know, it's a lot about training and education and about training again and skill building, um, which, uh, you know, needs resources full stop. <laughs> Thanks, Sven. Um, Michaela, I'm wondering if this is something also that you guys think about with your data platforms. Like, I would see that as a very obvious way to combat disinformation, but I'm wondering if if the thinking behind it goes further. Yeah. So I would say we're not working as explicitly on, you know, denialism or, or disinformation as, as Sven described, but I, I absolutely see data and the information that we're providing as a key way to combat that. Um, as I mentioned in my remarks, right, we're getting a lot of questions from journalists too about, you know, trying to understand what's going on and being able to point them to and, and understand the data and, and contextualize things. And, you know, one thing that I've seen a lot in my work is that there's certainly uh, disinformation and, and kind of more um, sabotaging, but there's also just not clear understanding about what's going on or certain things that potentially get blown out of proportion. So one example at the top of my mind is, uh, you know, there are these uh, forest fires in in the Brazilian Amazon in, in 2019 that got a lot of, of attention on social media and, and ended up getting a lot of press coverage. Um, and that was good, but just looking at the data, that year was not particularly intense for forest fires in the Brazilian Amazon. And so we occupy this interesting niche because on the one hand, like it's great that people are paying attention to forests and fires and the Amazon and 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 that has sparked so much understanding of, of what's going on and, and um, I guess attention to forests and, and climate change. At the same time though, it's important not to take those things out of context and, and report on them incorrectly. And so I think a lot of what we do is using the data to also give some of that nuance and as Sven mentioned, doing a lot of education uh, to journalists about, you know, okay, perhaps this is not particularly unusual, but this is still a big problem and results in X amount of emissions. And this year was particularly uh, affecting the city of Sao Paulo with smoke. So that's why it blew up on social media. Um, and so just being able to provide that kind of fact-based uh, information, I think is critical to really getting the story right. Thanks, Michaela. Um, Arthi, I was wondering if you had anything to share from your own work about how you guys are sort of thinking about this question in India. I think disinformation and misinformation are also kind of adjacent uh, issues. And I tend to agree that while there is not so much active climate denial denialism, there is something to be said in terms of how uh, you know, there is a lot of inertia in the system. Some of the biggest companies are oil and gas companies. The fossil fuel industry has been deeply entrenched. And it's not just a question of profits. It's also a question of employment and livelihoods and identities. And, uh, you know, to that extent, uh, just making sure that uh, there is also some kind of uh, right information that is put not just as an agenda to put clean energy out, but also through facts and data analysis and through uh, number crunching, the ability to show where future investment lies, where future future uh, assets lie. And I think uh, in India, that's been, that's been the way to tackle that. But because I'm also part of a bigger global uh, network working on climate communications, I think it is pretty clear that uh, disinformation is being used as delay tactics to some extent ever since the world has become excited about things like long-term targets and net zero, this has become uh, quite, a, quite, quite a prevalent way of, of at least kicking the can down the road, if, if nothing more. 
Thanks. So there's been a few questions that have come in about um, measuring impact to share with the funders that fund your journalism work. So one comes from Dan Mejia, who's with the Associated Press, who says, our climate team of 20 plus journalists is now philanthropically funded, but our challenge is always about pr proving impact to our donors. How do you all go about measuring and proving impact from your stories? Um, so maybe Arti, you can share a little bit and then Sven, I'd like to hear from you on this as well. Yeah, it's uh, like as uh, like always, you know, uh, the question on what you're doing in terms of impact is the most pertinent one. I, I still do believe that impact is not unidirectional in this case. It's about building that cohort of journalists who can ask the right questions. And we've tried to do that in the first couple of years at least. And I think that allows us to be in a situation where, where uh, the cascade of it is bigger than what we can anticipate uh, in the first instance and that's been that's been one way uh, the other way uh, as well is uh, just through supplying data and facts uh, make an argument which is rooted in 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 logic and uh, especially you know as as political sensitivities become quite active that's that's a short short way to make a good argument where you're rooting what you're trying to say in a domestic uh, domestic context and not just bringing a Western narrative uh, to, to a global South country where there are lots of other issues before climate becomes uh, the most important geopolitical discussion. I think uh, that's, that's uh, one other thing. And uh, other than that, I will only say that it's also very uh, hard sometimes, and I, I, I am conscious of that, that you cannot uh, simply equate number of stories or uh, the quantitative elements of what eventually will make a pivot to a decision maker. And I do think that sometimes telling the right story in the right tone and putting a good message in a right way has also been instrumental in changing at least the mind of one, one decision maker. And that in and of itself has also been powerful in some cases where we have seen how engaging at the state level or a city level you go and meet the urban local body and you know you try and show something through storytelling or 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 stuff that you have done and sometimes even just changing the mind of one or two policy makers is all that it takes to to count for impact thanks uh sven do you want to share anything about this well actually i can wholeheartedly subscribe and, and underscore what 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 Arti just said you know i mean there, you need in the core what, what how we interpret interpret what what Arti has been saying about you know don't look for the direct impact always uh, that that does happen sometimes you know but you know you have to believe in the role of good you know well crafted journalism and its various roles it has in society and then, you know, the, our impact measure, we have a number of quantitative things that, that we look at because we do our own publications and we can tell the number of people we worked with and things like that. But more importantly is that sort of idea that by just enabling more people, you know, you, you raise the boat if you want. And, um, and, and that, you know, is we, we try... Basically, if you ask me, you know, how to, to, to exemplify that, I would tell you a story about exactly what Arti has done, you know, saying that one journalist came, you know, on a research tour to Germany and, you know, we, he then wrote a number of really insightful articles about, you know, the subjects that was to his or her heart. So, um, I, I find, um, so that, that's, that's, you know, this sort of like qualitative part that Arti has mentioned is really important in, in communication in general. Um, you, you can't measure everything uh, in quantitative um, levels. And, and the other thing that I want to underscore and which is important for us is through the work we've done, the, the way we are approached now signals that, you know, we are taken seriously. We're, we're in the conversation about good journalism, best practice journalism on this. And, you know, how do you measure that? I mean, this is a vast indirect impact because they can only talk about the people who then call me up or invite me to a panel. But these are, you know, that, that it indicates that the way that we operate uh, seems to be interesting enough for a lot of people to start moving things. And that's why I'm saying playing the long game often pays off in, in unexpected ways sometimes maybe, or in, in ones that you could not put at the beginning of a project. 
um, yeah, that that would be my my sort of line on you know how to 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 evaluate in the larger sense the the impact um, of of our work. Thanks, Sven. Yeah, I think that also raises another really interesting point, which is what sort of reporting are funders expecting, and are they expecting too much or the right things? And that's an entirely different panel discussion. Um, so I'm, gonna... I'm happy to have that as well, if you want, I mean, uh... I'll let you know. So, um, I wanted to comment on the poll question that we did a couple of minutes ago, um, but it unfortunately seems to have disappeared, but I do remember that the, um, oh, it's back. Um, yeah, so some of the, the bigger answers on our word cloud were animal agriculture and climate justice. And there was actually a question about animal agriculture that came from Susanna Fetter, who wanted to ask. Why is the role of animal agriculture as a major cause of the climate and biodiversity crisis hardly ever mentioned by the media and scientists themselves? Um, so I wanted to actually put that to Michaela. Are you guys tracking sort of animal agriculture in your data platforms and why or why not? How are you thinking about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it certainly is something that we are tracking. Um, I can share in, in the chat in a second some research that we've done looking at the different drivers of deforestation and in particular looking at the breakdown of different agricultural drivers. And certainly pasture for cattle is the biggest driver of, of anything. Um, we're also working now, we have a, a new initiative at WRI that's looking at uh, satellite imagery analysis beyond forests called Land and Carbon Lab that's also starting to track pasture on an annual basis. So something similar as we do for forests, but actually being able to track the, the footprint of pasture on a regular basis and understand, you know, what uh, vegetation it's displacing and, and where are the biggest problem areas. So filling a key data gap there. But to the question of why is this getting less coverage than perhaps some other drivers, um, I think a big part of it is around the uh, kind of levers that we have to influence supply chains. So palm oil, for example, is one commodity that gets cited very often in the media uh, around deforestation in the tropics. Um, but if you look at the numbers, it's only around a quarter of the, the deforestation footprints that pasture and cattle is. But since uh, palm oil is mostly traded on the international markets and in particular to the EU, um, there is a lot of potential influence there in terms of you know, directly targeting the companies that are importing those areas and, and uh, being able to influence what the supply chains are and what zero deforestation commitments are in place. On the other hand, uh, a lot of beef and other uh, livestock um, meats is it's consumed domestically within markets in those same tropical countries where there might not be as much of a focus on sustainability. And so I think a lot of it has to do with those different patterns. Um, but but certainly, uh, you know, there is an understanding among the research community, those that are studying tropical forests, that beef really is uh, the main driver of deforestation. Thanks, Michaela. Um, so our next question, I'm going to put this one to Artie. So this came from when you were speaking uh, earlier, and it comes from Rebecca Giannotti, and she says, Artie raised a really important point about language. Is effective climate change communication limited by the homogeneities of language? I think to some extent, but depends on who the target is uh, and if we are really looking at expanding climate understanding at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, those who are at the margins and most impacted understand what's going on with their livelihoods and with their long term future. Then there is definitely a way to speak about it in the way that their lived experiences. Uh, we surveyed uh, six months back, we went to a coastal state in the country and in one particular district, just in one district, went to 500 people and half of them don't know what climate change is, but 90% of them say that their livelihood has been impacted by some changes in weather. And that's only when you prod and dig through the lived experience of what they are going through. And I think this becomes important to district level administration, it will become important to legislators and politicians. And, and if you really look at it from that lens, 
then yes, uh, empowering local communities to talk about what's going on with their life and livelihood in a way that it's part of a bigger global picture is something which can only happen when there is more homogeneous way of looking at climate change, not just as a Western concept, and I, I'd say that coming from India, but something that's here and now, but it's also getting equally damaging in the local context. I mean, I can go on and on about how there isn't a word for climate change or a phrase, and you have to build it into, into the dictionary. There is no word for low carbon in that way or for decarbonization. And there is uh, enough that can that 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 needs to be said. And uh, you know, it's not that uh, the languages in India are not old. A Hindi is one of the oldest languages, and Tamil is one of the oldest languages on the planet. So it's it, they they do exist in terms of very well defined literature. It is just that how we speak about uh, the subject really needs attention in the way that it merits some kind of public public usage of climate rather than just jargons. And I think uh, that has been the challenge. Thanks, Arthi. That's really interesting to think about language and, and the words that we even have to describe some of the processes that are happening with the planet heating up. Um, I'm going to put this next question to Sven. So uh, this comes from Claire, who asked, in the climate narrative, sometimes we seem to play the various aspects against one another, for example, mitigation versus resilience, soft so soft versus social versus justice, oh, sorry, soft or social or justice versus hardcore, net zero, et cetera. How have you overcome that in your experience? So I'm wondering if maybe in the work that you guys do um, with training journalists across borders, if this is something you think about. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think it's a very good point, and it just also show cases where we are in at least in many sort of industrialized countries at in the debate. This is now a debate about the best way forward. If you want to take an optimistic uh, um, take on it, and and a lot of the and it includes the question who should move first, who should move faster, you know, and 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 who will pay for for all of that. And then you're in the middle of a political debate, a society debate, where I mean, she says they are played against each other. Well, to a certain degree, you know, that there are questions that you know society needs to sort of find an answer to. Um, and, and this dialogue in a, in a conversation in a positive way, and also an international one, if you look at, at the discussions on a G7 level or in the, in the G20 level or in the context with um, the, the debates around climate finance and the COP uh, uh, discussions, this is really something that is at its core classical uh, political work. We just have to make sure, and that's what we try to talk to journalists about, that they, they, they can distinguish when is the debate about, you know, one way forward or another way forward, and when it is actually about one way back. Um, and and that's, it, that is really tricky, and that depends on the, on the debate and, and, so, and social justice or climate justice in general is a, is a perfect example for that, because if you, if you, it is a very valid, very important point to keep societies together through, uh, you know, the, the the right policy work and 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 the right you know compensation and all these sort of things. But if it's used to sort of throttle any progress, um, then you know we're 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 not getting anywhere. So that is. It is a tricky one. We do we do look into this with with colleagues, and 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 in, indeed it is one of we should probably and will be looking more into over the next few years because as we are br branching now out into a European debate, also the debate Europe and the rest of the world, as we've seen, all of a sudden what looks like a great thing uh, for one country might actually have a really bad effect on another country, and. You know, you need to, 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 to journalists need to look at that uh, and, and highlight this and say, well, but that, not in a scandalizing way. I feel very passionately about that. You have to be clear to your to your audience. This is what happens if you look in a democratic society or in a international uh, uh, discourse for a solution forward where there is not a simple answer that says, if we just do this, then everybody will be happy at the same time. 
So, yeah, I, I think you raised a very, very important point, and that is something that going forward, when we talk about, you know, what journalists should brace for, will become ever more dominant, that what looks like a solution here might be actually exactly the opposite uh, somewhere else. Definitely. Thanks, Sven. So I think we have time for one more question, and I'm going to put this to all three of you. So this one comes from Julia Williams, and she says, do you have any recommendations for organizations seeking funding for climate communications? So maybe, Arti, we can start with you. Do you have any thoughts on this? I think it's long term. First of all, it's very easy uh, to have highly ambitious proposals of changing the world in a year, but it's not practical. Uh, if philanthropy is compassionate, then I think uh, they offer a good start, but you also see results in in the medium term. Uh, change naturally is long term and, you know, it's just that climate change is fast, but uh, any other change is quite slow. So in, in that sense, I, I think just uh, when thinking about strategic communications on climate, it's important to do that matching between between the organization and who's funding them to be there for the long haul and one year or two years is not enough. It's also a question of really being able to fund what it takes to make the change. And again, you know, the scale of the problem is very large, but just being able to define some clear ways of what, what we would like to do in terms of activities or strategies or work plan uh, and, and as closely we can define it to outputs that we will give sometimes are also useful because outcomes by nature uh, in a comms project also get contributed by other research and technical organizations we will have which who will have an equal role to play uh, while 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 communications creates uh, ample surround sound yeah i'm sure uh, sven will have more to add on 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 this one sven do you want to add something it's always tough to add anything to what Artie says because I've been nodding all the time. So, yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, the strategic and long, uh, you know, playing the long game element uh, already. But I would say, you know, uh, and I completely agree with this. And but for, for funders and, and, and for projects, the same, you know, it needs to be clear. Is this something that you see as a strategic investment? If you go into sort of you know, changing certain certain uh, ways of covering the story, then you need time. And you can't do that in, in, in one go. But there might be elements, I mean, we're now preparing, for instance, you know, to, for the European elections next year uh, and looking into the role, you know, climate and energy policy will play at that. That has a clear end date or, you know, a clear sort of time framework where you could use this and put some efforts in to really highlight the, the story uh, in a very sort of contained uh, uh, time frame. So there you could argue that, you know, and, and there's a number of examples I could give now where you could, um, through a very targeted investment, make a difference on one specific, um, let's say, storyline uh, that's coming up because it's coming up anyway. Um, and, and that's uh, that's a, a, a challenge clearly for, for projects because you have to find a good mix you need the base funding to get the long term going, but you also need to be nimble and 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 adjust your your plans uh, to to you know important events and, and and stories coming up. I mean, we didn't expect the, you know the the climate last generation uh, um, protests to have such an impact here in in Germany again on society. So you have to adjust what you what you're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, so so that is it. I mean, you have two two levels, you know. And, and if you look, both can have their value, um, and and both are worth pursuing. You just have to get the mix right. Thanks, Fan. Michaela, I wanted to come to you before we finish today. Do you have any thoughts on this question of of uh, people who are looking for comms funding for climate? What works? Absolutely. So speaking about forests in particular, because that's what I know. Um, you know, I think there's been a lot of work over the past decade to get forests more into the uh, global agenda. And I, I think that's largely succeeded. You know, most people working in this space are now aware of, of the role that forests can play. But I think where we're still missing uh, a lot of coverage, and this comes back to the impact uh, conversation we were having earlier, is actually within the tropical countries themselves. 
there's a, a wide range, I would say, in, in the major forested countries in the tropics about the level of kind of awareness and um, accountability that, that different countries face and governments face in terms of deforestation. Um, just as an example, you know, Bolivia has, has now risen to the third spot for tropical primary forest loss, but receives way less attention internationally and domestically on deforestation than countries like Brazil or Congo or, or Indonesia. Um, and so really supporting some of those areas that have less of that kind of awareness. Um, there's, of course, also censor censorship issues in, in Bolivia also uh, is a piece of it. And again, this kind of investigative reporting also, so featuring local examples, local impacts, and empowering people who are telling the story more from the ground rather than at that 10,000 foot level. Thanks, Michaela. And thanks to all of you. Um, that's all the time we have for today, unfortunately. But I hope everyone here has enjoyed today's discussions. Uh, if you found it helpful and engaging, don't forget that you can subscribe to Alliance with the code CLIMATE23. Um, if you missed the offer during our event, we'll be sending it out to you in an email shortly, uh, as well as a recording of today's conversation. And we'll also do a little write-up afterwards as well. Um, so I'd like to end by saying thank you so much to our panelists today, Sven, Michaela, and Artie. You've been wonderful. Thank you to the Alliance team for producing and covering today's event. Thanks to all of you for joining and being part of the Alliance community today. Uh, our next event will be in June on new giving vehicles and tools, which is the subject of our June magazine, which is coming out soon. Um, the, the event will be sponsored by Optimi, so make sure you're signed up to our mailing list and you won't miss the invitation. And thank you everyone for joining us today and we'll see you next time.